When I became first lady, it became demanding for me. I have to dress up and make myself more beautiful because the poor always looks for a star in the dark of the night. I don't have an answer for why we allow Imelda to even open her mouth. The best politician that I've ever seen is my mother. Her big dream is to restore the greatness of the Marcos family. It's scary if these people are brought to power again. I was always criticized for being excessive, but that is mothering. 3,000 pairs of shoes. Shipping animals from Africa. Picasso. Michelangelo. The demonstrators stormed the gates of the palace to take back what they said was theirs. There was a big reception. I had to wear jewelry. And we were told, get into the helicopter. So I put diamonds in diapers. It saved us later on to pay the lawyers. Melda Marcos has gotten away with murder. That case remains unresolved. Why will I do that? I, I had nothing against him, except that he talked too much anyway. The Marcuses scrubbed clean the sins of the past. Nobody said you can't do it. She came back. They found no skeletons, only beautiful shoes. Little did we know they financed the election of Duterte, paving the way for Bongbong Marcos. People were just taking it too easy, not believing that it was possible. Like yeah. Trump, no one saw Trump coming. People forget the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat them. I want to mother not only the Philippines, but the world. Nobody can stop me. Perception is real, and the truth is not. People who forget the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat them. Perception is real, and the truth is not. Okay, everyone, we're about to start the discussion. So if everyone could take their seats, that would be great. And this is Sai Versai, and you're listening to Cultural Learnings on Manila Community Radio. And we're broadcasting live from Otto in Poblacion for a post-screening panel discussion on The Kingmaker, the 2019 documentary directed by Lauren Greenfield about the controversial history of former Philippine First Lady Imelda Marcos and her family. This event is brought to you by Otto, the Daquila Philippine Collective for Modern Heroism with their learning arm Active Vista, and Manila Community Radio, where this event is being broadcasted live as part of my radio show, Cultural Learnings. I want to preface this event with a statement that MCR provided me. Borrowing from journalist Christian Amanpour's words, MCR does not believe in moral equivalence nor factual equivalence. Let's be truthful, not neutral. We insist on being nonpartisan, but we'll let the facts and the Marcos lies in the documentary speak for itself. Me, as a journalist, I very much align with this view. During this discussion, I will be both moderating and providing my own personal insight into how I interpreted the film. This is actually a conscious effort on my end with my writing practice because I believe in the importance of positioning myself and remaining reflexive in order to understand the truth, what is real, and what can be changed. This is a safe space for discourse, and we encourage critical and civil discussion. So we have a really special panel today dissecting The Kingmaker, which just finished its on-ground viewing here in Otto. We'll be picking apart the semantics and semiotics of the film in the context of the upcoming elections in May. If you don't know what those words mean, semantics is the study of meaning and truth, while semiotics is the study of signs. A sign is anything that communicates a meaning that is not the sign itself, and it can be found in things like metaphors, allegories, symbolisms, and so, so much more. 
Our panelists are Philbert D. He's a writer and film critic and festival programmer. Occasionally, he uploads film reviews on his YouTube channel, Phil on Films. And for most of his career, he has documented and commented on the highs and lows of Filipino cinema. Hi, Phil. Good evening. We also have Mark Fortaleza, program manager for campaigns at Active Vista Human Rights Center. And since 2012, he's been with Daquila, an organization focused on social justice advocacy. Let's begin. Hi, sorry. Hi, Mark. Hello. Um, let's begin this discussion. And I actually want to start with you, Phil. So there's a letterbox review which you wrote in April 6, 2020. And today's April 5, so just a day off from the, from the day you wrote that review two years later. And uh, you gave that film two and a half stars. And you wrote a review on it, but the gist of it could be I think encapsulated in this quote that you give, that you give, which is that we do not need to talk to the Marcuses to explore their evil. So if the the goal of the film was indeed to explore the evil of the Marcuses, then there's no need to platform Imelda to vindicate her family because, in your opinion, there are no two sides to the Marcus story. There's only one, which is that the Marcos. The Marcuses objectively stole millions and killed thousands. So has this view on the movie changed since you saw it two years ago? Uh, not at all. Honestly, watching it again uh, made me really mad. It just made me madder. Uh, I feel like I've already spent most of my life hearing the Marcuses repeat their lies. And like putting Imelda on an international platform, calling her the, pilf, uh, the kingmaker, putting her on a poster, uh, showing off her wealth, showing her going to the cancer center, having people tell her that like, oh, we're so grateful to you, you built this or whatever. I think it only adds to this long, sad history of us uh, tolerating the Marcoses. Fair enough. I think what was jarring for me was like how relevant it still was because a lot of the footage came from 2015 when they were following the campaign trails for 2016 and then you have this like weird parallelism parallelism with like bong bong marcos running for vice presidency and lenny as well running for vp and then i would like recently i've been getting like information on the news about how BBM is leading the polls and how just a few weeks ago, bef just a few weeks before the elections in 2016, BBM was also leading in the polls. So there was this weird, like, I don't know, it, it felt almost like, as the film kind of suggested history, sort of repeating itself in a small way. Um, Mark, drawing from your background in creative writing, where do you stand in terms of how this film is structured to instill a response from its audience? Um, uh, well, coming from the people naman na nagpapakalat ng pelikula, no? so uh, we think kasi parang okay pa rin na uh, laging remind yung mga tao of uh, their atrocities and uh, parang um, uh, giving emphasis on the uh, harmful dominant narratives na binibigay nila, no? So parang um, um, when you uh, really think about it and uh, kapag napanood nyo pa yung iba bang documentaries na um, starring Imelda, no? Parang paulit-ulit lang din naman yung script na um, sinasabi niya at uh, binibigay niya. Uh, pero um, I think... Um, one of the best ways kasi of um, uh, educating people then since um, uh, barely institutionalized yung um, uh, his, uh, uh, study of uh, martial law sa Pilipinas no, is to um, towards um, informal education as well kasi parang um, naniniwala din kasi kami na um, uh, films, uh, music, the arts may not... Uh, Alam mo yun, ligtas sa mundo, pero I mean, it can change the perception ng mga tao. No? Um, well, lalagyan mo ng truth na hindi lang siya, <laughs> yung sinabi ni Imelda na perception is uh, true and the uh, truth is not or something. <laughs> Ayan. So interesting kasi yung pag-format ng documentary and I want to know, either of you can go first, on ano yung role ng documentary in taking a stance? Because as a journalist, which I think 
is very similar to a documentary filmmaker. There's one, the need to provide a big picture and two, to stand up to the truth. So for either of you, um, yeah, and to add to that, when you're providing multiple versions of someone's truth, then what becomes of the truth? So what role does a documentary have in taking a stance? Uh, documentaries can't really be neutral. Uh, as long as there's a person behind the camera, the camera is subjective. It's, uh, you choose what you show. You choose what, you, uh, what ends up in the final edit. Here, you, for example, you see, specifically, I think Lauren Greenfield's fascinations are, involve uh, the aesthetics of affluence. So uh, you'll see her pointing the camera at money. You'll see her pointing, like uh, when she talks to Imelda, she doesn't just talk to Imelda in some random with like a white background. It, she has to be surrounded by her wealth. So obviously, like, she's making a point uh, that like, you can't separate Imelda from her wealth. And that, that in itself is a stance. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, a, you're, it's just going to be, I think as a human being, uh, it's natural to have opinions about what you're seeing. And uh, yeah, any documentary has to make a stand somewhere, especially when you're uh, straight up witnessing something terrible, which I think Lauren Greenfield got to witness firsthand, which is the near election of Bong Bong Marcos as vice president. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, parang uh, in addition lang dun sa sinabi ni uh, Sir Philbert, no, na parang um, hind, uh, lagi siyang lilitaw yung dun sa loob ng documentary kung ano yung stand, I think, ng filmmaker dun sa ginagawa niya at hindi siya, uh, hindi siya magtatago dun sa ano lang, dun sa work niya. Kasi, for example, very notable sa akin yung scene na um, yung nanay from Kalawit na um, he hears Imelda saying that perception is real and the truth is not, pero uh, sa kanilang community, yung nanay dun sa Kalawit, ay, they kept uh, a part of the uh, crates na pinanggalingan ng mga animals na pinadala dun sa, ano nila, dun sa lugar nila kung saan sila pinalaya. So parang, um, I think, um, very powerful enough yun, uh, like, uh, in their own ways, parang, uh, may fact-checking, no? Parang may reminder sila ng atrocities na ginawa sa kanila. So very strong yung, um, yung part na yun. And then dun sa, um, I think, yung stand din ng um, mga tao behind the film. Um, Phil, you mentioned something earlier about um, about well, in your review, you were talking about how we don't need to talk to the Marcuses to know about what they did. Um, what would have been, in your eyes, a more effective way to evoke that without having to platform the Marcuses? Uh, let me let me just give an example of a film that doesn't platform the bad side. There's this film called this documentary called Aswang, also being shown by Dakila, by Alex Rompak. It's about the drug war, and it doesn't talk to policemen, doesn't talk to politicians to justify the drug war. It stays on the streets, talks to the people who are affected by it, and uh, we get to see we uh, we get to see what it's actually like instead of like hearing talking heads like tell uh, repeat the lies of the administration. So here, like instead of like talking to the Marcoses, just talk to Mayor Rodriguez. Like just have her like have her struggle at the Bantayog be the subject. Only talk to Andy Bautista talk, talk, uh, like to document what the PCGG has been doing for 30 years. Like, why do we need to keep talking to the Marcoses? We, we have all the evidence that we need to know that they're evil. What, we've, what we're missing is a lot of documentation on the people who have been f actively fighting against that misinformation. Mark, um, as campaigns director, program manager for campaigns for Dakila. I'm sure madami na yung mga iba ibang screenings na puntahan nyo. Ano yung mga parang responses from audiences, whether foreigners sila or uh, Filipino in terms of when, how they see the film? Because I feel like there might be two different responses. There's the, wow, this is so new, I di ko alam to dati. Or parang actually this isn't anything new. So. Coming, like going to different screenings and interacting with different event organizers. Ano yung parang mga ibang responses ng audiences to the film? Um, hindi pa ko nakasama sa team no, na uh, foreigners yung, uh, yung nanood ng film. Pero uh, nakasama ko mostly mas mga nasa 
uh, junior high school and senior high school, mga students at saka college, um, mas uh, pumupunta lagi dun sa question na bakit iba-iba yung uh, memories natin uh, uh, when it terms to, uh, no, to uh, the story of martial law. So, um, uh, inote ko lang na uh, this is from um, the historian uh, Alvin Campomanes. No? So, parang um, we always answer them na different kasi nga, uh, magkakaiba talaga yan kasi iba-ibang memories ng mga tao. But, uh, there is uh, history nga kasaysayan na uh, where uh, sobrang masinsin yung pag-research, uh, etc. ng mga bagay-bagay. So, parang uh, it's the uh, mas uh, community memory siya kaysa dun sa um, sabi lang ng lolo niya or sabi lang ng lola niya, ganyan. So, um, mostly yon and then uh, medyo nakakatakot din yung um, mostly din sa mga bata na parang uh, sino na lang yung paniniwalaan namin. There's that fear na parang um, we don't know where to find uh, the stories anymore or where are the, ano, uh, where are the sources, ganyan. So, parang I do agree with... Uh, uh, Sir Philbert din na parang mas mag-surface tayo ng mga uh, uh, narratives from doon sa mas uh, hindi na uh, mas na-emphasize which is yung kwento ng mga tao at hindi na ng mga um, s s sila. <laughs> well, the Marcoses. <laughs> Could you elaborate more on this uh, concept of community memory? Ah, sorry. Um, si, uh, sabi ni Sir Alvin na parang um, uh, nagkakaroon ng difference when it comes to stories nung sa martial law kasi um, kailangan mong tingnan na uh, different ang memory from um, kasaysayan, ang, ang, ang alaala sa kasaysayan. Because uh, kasaysay, uh, alaala is very uh, personal. Um, pwede kasing uh, during that time ay uh, well off kayo. Hindi naman natin i di disregard yon baka naman okay sila nga noon pero uh, may mga tao na hindi so parang um uh, tawag dito when you really look at it na parang sinasabi na maraming mga tao ang nagsasabi na okay noon marami din naman mga tao ang nagsasabi na hindi okay noon pero uh, ito nga yung mga truths and stories na hindi na surface so um which brings us to history or kasaysayan na siya yung nag-iipon ng collective memory or uh, community memory ng uh, mga tao. So, ayun. Okay. Um, I want to uh, explore this point of whether yung documentary, whether it humanizes or dehumanizes its subjects, whether it's the Marcoses or um, the other people that they, they spoke to. So, I just want, and what comes to mind for me when I ask this question is, and I had this discussion with another person, na parang, yeah, to what extent does the documentary humanize Imelda? Because I think she comes from like this, she often talks about values of beauty, values of family, and values of being a mother and greatness. And she tries to draw empathy from the interviewer and I guess the audiences and people that believe in her, na parang, oh, I would never do that. Or we were robbed from, um, you know, our opportunities and our riches. I can't, like, get my money from 170 banks. So uh, to what extent do you think is the humanizing happening? In my opinion, I feel like the humanizing is coming from uh, Imelda's attempt to humanize herself. I don't, I'm not sure necessarily it comes from the director because I think by the end of the film, if you have some sort of, like, empathy for the Marcuses, it's, I'm, I'm not sure if you got a correct reading from the director because I think they tried to portray the ostentatiousness and the wealth and the affluence in a sort of um, yeah, ostentatious way that deprived a lot of people of a livelihood. So to what extent does the documentary humanize or dehumanize um, its subjects? Um. Yeah, it's mahira e separate yung personal feelings ko about Imelda from um uh, like in that idea of like does the documentary humanize her? I don't know because to me she is not human. Like uh, it's beyond uh, beyond any rational human experience. Uh, but I do believe that if you let people talk, that make that humanizes them, whether you intend it or not. Um, the more you let them talk, the more you allow them 
to speak from their own human experience. Naturally, lumalabas yung humanity nila. And here, uh, and again, like, on a, f on a whole scale, uh, the film, I think, clearly has a stance that, like, Imelda is this terrible person. But, like, there are moments, there are moments that you're like, okay, there's, there, there's, you, it, when the film doesn't exist only to say things about Imelda Marcos, it captures some things that do humanize her, I think. Like again, like the cancer center, the children's cancer center. When uh, the nurse tells her, "Ah, you, this is one of your great projects," doesn't that humanize her to some extent? If you take it out of context from the rest of the film, which in this economy of attention of short clips on the internet, I think that's kind of dangerous. So yeah, uh, whether or not the film humanizes her, I think that's just a natural consequence of spending time with people. Um, Mark, one of the, I know one of the things that ginagawa mo sa Dakila is to explore this idea of narrative change making and how, uh, like, putting out a narrative about a certain story or um, a certain idea can change the way people think. Um, and what, how, what do you have to say about this tactic of like humanizing a politician or humanizing a controversial figure um, in your own research? Um, uh, personally, hindi ko na rin kasi nakikita si Imelda as a person na rin. She has become a, ewan ko, like parang dinrowing na niya yung sarili niya as like this. Because uh, when you look back uh, sa history, no, they used the um, the malakas at maganda mythology to to uh, to push their, the narrative that they want na si Marcos is the malakas and then um, Imelda is the beauty. And then uh, if you really follow um, uh, the history at kung ano yung mga ginawa ni Imelda before, it's always the beauty, it's always the mothering, na parang everything she say ay script na siya. So um, uh, we look at the film na as um, uh, the, the narrative that the Marcoses tell ay siya na yung um, dominant narrative, which is uh, harmful na hindi sila... Uh, hindi sila accountable for this at wala silang ninakaw and then wala silang, uh, wala silang kasanalan, etc., etc. As opposed to dun sa mga kwento nila uh, Miss May at ng mga uh, sa community sa Kalawit, di ba? Na parang um, nagugulat din actually yung mga tao nakakapanood na uh, ngayon lang namin to naririnig, which is bad kasi <laughs> dapat yun yung ano eh, dapat yun yung dominant narrative na alam natin. That is the desired narrative that uh, we want everyone to know. So, um, in terms of narrative change making, it's just one part of um, uh, uh, positive social change na kailangan natin uh, sa Pilipinas. So, parang, um, uh, yeah, uh, babalik ako ulit na sa sinabi ni, ni Sir Philbert nga na parang, uh, that's uh, surface most, uh, uh, the surface yung narratives na totoo at saka um, yung desired natin, kung ano talaga yung, um, what uh, we, uh, what we should know as uh, Filipinos. Ayan. Okay. Um, I want to explore yung, yung character of the mother uh, in, na, in storytelling and narrative making and cinema. Um, I will probably yield to you, Phil, as the film critic. Um, what makes this character or archetype of the mother so effective. Like a film that comes to mind is goes by the same name, Mother, by Darren Aronofsky. I sort of didn't expect the turn that it would take towards the end, but um, I don't think this spoils the movie. But like there are these these images of like grandeur where you can see it in nature. There were like scenes of like war that sort of alluded to uh, ideas of like a beginning and an end and having that associate with this concept of the mother which is like some sort of there's a scale to the archetype um, and which Imelda sort of uses in her um, narrative for the Marcuses so what is it that makes the character of the mother so effective in cinema and how would you pick apart this symbol of her as the mother and the matriarch, both as a narrative device for the kingmaker, but also as a rhetorical device um, by the director. Uh, well, uh, to say why uh, mothers are so powerful in uh, not just movies, but in any narrative form is we all have mothers. We all, we all came from a mother. Uh, 
like uh, one would immediately argue that we have a closer connection with to a mother than a father by nature of the fact that we come out of a mother. So uh, I mean, it's always played a part in all of literature and all of mythology. So um, like, uh, yeah, uh, patriarchal society or whatever. But in the end, like th um, we all love our mothers. It's, it's always we we are nurtured by our mothers. We literally feed from our mothers. So that image in itself is uh, is inherently powerful because it's a uh, we we. Uh, the, the archetype is an absent father, right? Like if we're just picking between parents. Uh, so we're always going to look up to a mother, always going to hang on to this idea of a mother. In the like, and to pick apart uh, Imelda's image from, of a mother, uh, you see it as like, um, I think the film very much portrays it as a, as a facile relationship. Uh, this whole idea that like, oh, she's giving out money to people. Like, uh, <laughs> but you don't see her like it immediately challenges it by making sure to show her relationship with the hired help. Like uh, she does not look them in the eye, doesn't really, like w when she says, when she says to that, uh, to that one lady to like uh, uh, get money for candy, like it's like, it's so dismissive. It's so like, uh, so uh, Imelda sees herself as a mother, but that goes into this just idea of like being able to give people money. Because money is the only thing uh, she's really hanging on to, and I think that's a credit to the documentary to pick that up. But again, that's I think that's Greenfield's particular specialty in documentary filmmaking in picking out the facile nature of the lives of the very rich. Her idea of mothering is being able to give kids one thousand pesos for candy. Yeah. And there's this anong eh, um this connection between the excessiveness and the mothering and her values of beauty and family. Um, I've, I'll pull two quotes that she said in the documentary. One is, excessiveness is a characteristic of mothering. And two, beauty is the extravagance of love. And uh, you can relate that with the concept of the edifice complex, which um, Mark, I actually want to ask you about. Uh, could we? Could you explain what the edifice complex is to our audiences? Ah, uh, from uh, yung sa libro from the ano uh, the from the book Edifice Complex na uh, sorry I forgot the name of the author pero um, uh, there uh, tawag dito yung grandeur of uh, parang uh, pinakikita nila yung um, themselves, parang monuments of themselves by uh, creation of um, like yung, yung malalaking, uh, malalaking infrastructures na niyayabang nila na pinagawa. Pero uh, actually, there are uh, many um, atro atrocities behind it na parang uh, uh, for example na lang ay uh, um, may mga utang at uh, hindi na at, at may mga namatay while uh, creating these structures. Pero basically, um, uh, parang nagagaling lang din naman siya dun sa uh, forever naman na ginagawa din ng mga um, authoritarian rules na parang laging dapat merong um, laging merong structure built to remind people na ito kami, malaki kami, strong kami, ganyan. Pero um, yung sa kanila ay parang naging ano lang. Uh, well, functional siya, pero you can't really say kasi yung iba ay hindi gumagana. Yung iba ay uh, supposedly tinibag na dahil nga hindi maayos yung pagkakabuo uh, sa kanila. So, um, ayun. <laughs> um, an, uh, paano man ako consolidate yung idea na to na parang without, like, ano magiging ng Pilipinas without these cultural institutions? Because to, to an extent, they have some sort of influence in the cultural industries and the arts. So I'm talking about institutions like FDCP, which is the Film Development Council. There's the Experimental Cinema of the Philippines. And then there's the CCP, which is the Cultural Center of the Philippines. So uh, what type of Philippines would we be if these, exist these institutions never existed? Um, and a lot of people attribute that to the Marcuses. So, either of you, ano masasabi mo dyan? Um, I think, uh, oh, uh, ang first question ko kasi doon is, um, okay, uh, na-build uh, itong malalaki infrastructures na to, pero kasi at what cost? Eh, may mga buhay na nawala, may uh, utang tayo hanggang uh, 2025 or something. Um, 
tapos um, it was made to mask kasi the the um, yung mga kasalanan na nangyayari na nung panahon na yon so um, hindi siya binilled actually for uh, to to uh, ano ba to to mother <laughs> using Imelda's term no pa, ang, ang ang arts and culture sa Pilipinas kasi kahit uh, buhay naman siya and then you can actually create a uh, 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 center or things like that pero hindi at uh, hindi siya dapat um, hindi siya dapat nagko-cost ng buhay at ng um, ng hard earned money ng mga tao na dapat nagagamit nila for them to actually uh, uh, develop themselves in the culture and the arts, di ba? So parang, alam mo yan, nagkakaroon, nag-connecta na siya in, in the end na parang mas hindi, uh, for example, uh, nahihirapan, um, ang, uh, nahihirapan tayo hanapin yung mga sarili natin in terms of culture, pero uh, if, yeah, if na nagamit ng mas maayos siguro yung mga pera or um, mas nag mas nag-nourish ka muna, I think, kaysa nagpatayo ka ng uh, um, mga malalaking buildings just to uh, uh, just to show force or um, para lang pagtakpan yung mga atrocities mo noong panahon na yon ay um, ayan mag, ayan <laughs> sorry uh, I think it's ano rin, it's naturally fallacious to say that like uh, these things wouldn't exist without the Marcoses who's to say na Another president wouldn't have created the same cultural institutions, maybe in like a, in a better context that didn't cost as many lives as many as as much money, uh, didn't end up stealing so much. So yeah, uh, I mean, we can't rem we can't keep being grateful to the Marcoses for things that they built that we should that we deserve anyway. Um, I want to divert from the the edifice complex and the building tendencies of the Marcos for a little bit to focus on, I guess, Imelda's character arc because there's something that I've been hearing a lot from friends um, about people, who, like friends who saw the film that say that sh there's some sort of delusionary thinking in Imelda. Um, not like, I don't know, like I'm not to say like whether to what extent that is true, but I think there are signs in the film or like the filmmakers were maybe alluding to it to in some sort of way. So I'll give some examples. There's a sense of grandeur in the way Imelda recounts herself and her life. First of all, there's this idea of mothering the nation. She flexes her friends like Gaddafi, Saddam, and Mao, and talks about bringing peace not just to the Philippines, but the world. I guess she draws from her, I guess, diplomatic position and being surrounded by these influential people. And there's also this, if we look outside Imelda, there's this absurdity to the delusion that's evident in the Freudian slips that come out. So. With Imelda, there's the example of, I have money in 170 banks. I'm not sure if she meant to say that. It just came out of her mouth. And by the way, if you don't know what a Freudian slip is, it's the, this idea that your unconscious will be able to speak for, your, for itself in a conscious manner, in the, in the manifesting in slips of the tongue or things that you didn't mean to say when really deep down you were sort of meant to say it. So that's what a Freudian slip is. And another example is when Sandro Marcos, the son of Bong Bong Marcos, talks about his dad and how he got into politics. And he was sort of saying, oh, there's no money in being, a, um, being involved in physics or taking up music, just switch to politics. Um, another one is Bong Bong talking about him not being able to fly in coach, he needs to fly in first class, and sort of like goes on about it. So I feel like these slips of the tongue and these sort of allusions to delusion, there's a certain absurdity to it that's really revealing. Um, so what do you guys think the filmmakers were trying to convey in terms of these, um, I guess, slips of the tongue? Because in one, th in one way, it's hard to fake saying those things and at the same time like there's still the sleight of hand of the editor in the editing room so what do you guys think about um, those little things uh, again again this is goes back to like the expertise of Lauren Greenfield as a filmmaker uh, I think uh, th this kind of delusion I think isn't 
unique to the Marcos I mean, they have a very specific brand of it that uh, that involves the fate of an entire country. But like, to be affluent is to have some delusion. Like, you need the delusion to survive because it's inherently unjust to be <laughs> to be really, really rich. And I think they have to justify to themselves somehow by like uh, by creating this like image of themselves that's greater than the average person. Like, oh yes, I'm a mother. I am the savior of the world. I am, uh, yeah, I, I have to project this, this whole thing because they need to justify to themselves uh, because uh, it's absurd. It's absurd to be that rich. The absurdity is inherent. And I think Greenfield is really good at pointing out how absurd being rich is. Uh, that's a, a running theme in all of our documentaries. Mark, do you have anything to add to uh, kung in terms of how you read the film, what um, do those examples strike to you? Um, parang uh, for me, uh, while watching the film, parang pumasok na lang siya sa akin na you can't keep uh, doing a character. So parang, uh, kahit naman hindi, uh, I think, hulihin ng filmmakers, uh, lalabas at lalabas talaga siya kasi... Um, many docus na ni Imelda na nagsislip talaga siya uh, na nagpapakita siya ng mga bagay-bagay na uh, if you really think about it, hindi niya dapat pinapakita if ayaw niya <laughs> ayaw niya magtuloy-tuloy yung um, kaso sa kanila so uh, i think uh, yun yun lang yung simpleng basa ko sa kanya okay um, so i think just from this conversation it's clear how the relationship between narrative and rhetoric go hand in hand. And when used correctly or cunningly, it can be really effective. And I think the documentary portrayed how there's this, this effort of like historical revisionism that's happening on the part of the Marcuses to vindicate their name, um, whether in the form of education systems, like in the documentary they showed um, children in school talking about like the glory days of the, Fili of the Philippines under the Marcuses, and right now it's happening through social media campaigns, through um, I, I guess like a network of macro micro influencers who are trying to, on behalf of the Marcuses, to uh, perpetrate this sort of narrative. Um, Mark, I want to, I'm interested to know um, Dakila's work in terms of um, finding out the extent of the Marcos historical revisionism in terms of how it's happening today. Um, meron bang mga iba't ibang bagay that uh, strikes you, like yung pang a fact that sort of illustrates to you the severity or the urgency of what's happening in terms of historical revisionism? Um, the fact na um, I think yung, yung, uh, uh, yung nar narrative of nung, pina, nung nilibing na si Marcos dun sa libingan ng mga bayani, that already is parang sobrang grave na niya kasi para siyang, uh, para siyang uh, nal nalibing and then na nag-rise up na parang revival of the Marcoses sa uh, sa we show at sa consciousness ng mga tao na parang um, it was better nung panahon nila etc cetera, etc cetera, na ang hirap um, ang hirap niyang uh, labanan uh, and at the same time kasi they have they all have the machinery to um, to uh, to propagate no parang naalala ko nga nung uh, hindi ko alam kung kayo rin no nung fa nung ang Facebook ay uh, nagpapasahan pa lang ng mga uh, baboy at chips yung mga tao for Farmville eh nakakakita na ako ng uh, Marcos uh, regime was the golden age before Marcelo was the golden age before so parang um, yeah, it uh, it took them a uh, long time pero uh, they actually have the resources for that and then um, yung mga tao naman na nagsurface ng truth ay mas sila pa yung um, uh, wala masyadong um, resources or uh, at the same time um, uh, sinisiraan pa yung uh, uh, mga uh, information and truths uh, or credibility nga ng mga tao na nag uh, sa surface ng truths na yun. So parang um, sa work ng Dakila, um, uh, fighting for human rights comes, uh, uh, it includes nga uh, fighting disinformation kasi karapatan ng lahat ng tao ang uh, ang malaman ng katotohanan. Um, and, ayun, I think yun muna siguro. Yeah. Phil, before I arrived here in Ottawa, I was actually watching a video that 
you uh, were g you're giving a TEDx talk about how yeah. to deal with trolls. Um, and you were talking about how to deal with trolls in the context of uh, Filipino cinema. And there was something that struck me na parang um, the way people think about, um, I guess, the way people think about someone's opinion is not about recognizing that they have a different experience from mine, but it's about joining one camp or the other. Yeah. Um, in terms of historical revisionism, and I guess your experience of writing and being and living on the internet, how do you deal or um, what do you have to say about the extent of, I guess, the Marcos historical revisionism? Mahir, when it comes to the Marcos, is because you don't know if the person you're engaging with is a real person. Uh, so my approach with dealing with that so far has just been like, uh, uh, yeah, no, I'll just block this. Uh, if, if I'm, the, but like if I'm talking, if I meet a person who is actually pro Marcos, I do go out of my way to try to talk to them and like really just ask questions because I feel like uh, the uh, I feel like most people don't get the don't really get to have that conversation. They're uh, it, they're in a they're in a uh, echo chamber in a bubble like hearing the same things over and over. Nobody's asking questions. And it's more, it's more interesting anyway to just, instead of telling them that Marcos was bad, just do the Socratic method. Keep asking questions, keep listening, let them talk it out. Because I think it's so self-evident that like Marcos was bad. That once you start questioning this belief, it's, uh, it just falls apart. Have you ever had an experience of like talking to uh, uh, Duterte or Bongbong Marcos supporter and like, have you developed like have you ever had a conversation with um, a BBM or Duterte supporter and having some sort of insight or changing their mind or could you, do you have something to recount? I, I I can't tell you that I change anybody's mind, but I've had conversations. I've had a lot of conversations, not just about Duterte or Marcos. I once had once around here in Poblacion, I ran into an American who was a really big Trump supporter, <laughs> and yeah, no, it was really just about. Uh, questioning these things that they think are so self-evident because uh, I think people are smarter than people give them credit for right? like everybody keeps thinking oh yeah they believe this they must be dumb they're like as, but it's just a lack of hearing uh, hearing the questions you just uh, yeah so I, I, ca I can't I can't uh, I can't be convinced 100 percent that like uh, I changed anybody's mind but I had the conversation, and I think that's the thing to do. Mark, in your um, advocacy work, since you deal with a lot of trying to inform people about, um, I guess, what sort of narrative they are being presented with and to provide them the tools to question them, have, do you have any stories or can you recount any occasion where maybe you changed someone's mind that was otherwise hard to change? Um, could you tell us a story? Um, Ako rin, hindi ko rin alam kung may nabago kong isip. Pero uh, most of these people nga, uh, there was this one um, screening we had sa Escolta. And then, um, I think, hindi niya lang sinasabi, pero uh, I think uh, supporter siya. Uh, and um, I think yung isa sa mga sentiments niya kasi ay uh, hindi sila hinihear out nung, um, nung mga taong kalaban nila. You just bombard them with um, links and... Um, uh, malika, malika, malika. Baka kasi uh, mas okay kung um, ang conversation na pwedeng gawin is you find a middle ground where they, uh, actually alam mong nahuli mo na sila if they're asking questions na rin about dun sa ano, dun sa uh, bakit siya mali, bakit siya ganto ganyan. And then you can just lead them on dun sa um, mga dapat nila talagang malaman. So I think um, mahirap siya. I know, uh, sali, minsan sumasali din ako sa mga bardagolan sa comment section sa Facebook, pero um, uh, if we really find people na totoong tao at hindi trolls, di ba? Parang, um, ano, madali lang naman, parang uh, madali lang actually makipag-usap sa tao, as in tao, hindi sa uh, copy-paste at mga nakaw na pictures <laughs> online as a uh, Facebook or Twitter accounts. Um, I want to share something interesting that I stumbled upon um, the internet recently. Uh, there's this Instagram account called Media Commoner, and they posted a carousel 
like a group of photos, a group of text about this concept of strategic silence. And strategic silence is basically the action of remaining silent and therefore uh, maintaining some an entity that's otherwise controversial or in crisis maintaining their status in the conversation um, because it means that if you avoid damage at all, then it doesn't really change what position you're in. Um, and Bongbong Bong Marcos has been notorious during this election round for not attending debates. Um, Phil, I can see on your Twitter that you've been following the debates, like the one the other day. Um, and actually, bef in preparation for this talk, I started watching the ones um, from the Comelec recently. So. I don't know, like for me, there, there's something striking about not seeing Bong Bong there. Uh, the fact that he can't say his piece and that everyone else is like showing their personality and being able to promote whatever initiatives they have um, to become president. So I guess from an analytical point of view, what does the absence of Bong Bong have to say um, from like a, like a rhetorical perspective? Like in your eyes, like if, if strategic silence is meant to avoid damage and maintain status, like I guess in your eyes, like how, what does that say about his participation? It says he thinks he's winning. That's pretty much it. Uh, if he had anything to gain by going to debates, he would, he would be there. But uh, he feels like he's already far ahead. And uh, I don't think he trusts himself enough to not screw up a debate. So. He, yeah, because he's not that smart. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Mark, do you have I, anything to say I think because um, uh, tinitingnan din namin yung kampanya nila na parang uh, Bongbong -bong is actually a weakness sa sarili niyang kampanya. So, <laughs> wala lang. Uh, kaya siguro siya hindi pumupunta dun sa mga um, uh, sa debates. And, um, well, sa in terms of surveys, kasi no, una pa rin naman siya. So, parang yeah, uh, I agree with Sir Philbert na if may something to gain siya doon sa ano, like yung pinuntahan niya na SMNI debates, kasi yeah, something to, to gain from from that uh, debate. Uh, dito ay hindi. Kukuyugin lang siya ng mga tao. Wala nga siya doon sa debate, kinukuyug siya. So parang, ayan. Uh, I want to give my own personal um, story about, I guess, the nature of discourse now during the elections. I was talking to someone um, who was a Lenny supporter, and you know they were saying like, yes, like we're for Lenny, okay? Da 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 da. And I was just like, oh, like I like personally, like I I feel like I'm not fully informed on all the candidates. I'm definitely not voting for Bongbong Bong Marcos. That's one. Um, Jose Montemayor is like a questionable character from the debates that I've seen. Um, th that those are like my concrete opinions about the presidential candidates at the moment but you know like in terms of like talking to other people when they are advocating who their president is and then I asked them oh so um, in the case of this Lenny supporter like have you had any conversations with a bong bong Marco supporter and what did you say to them and they were sort of like ah like you know if they're a BBM supporter then di na lang makikiusap like just let's not talk about it. And I feel like that's the nature of discussion and discourse um, in the Philippines right now in terms of the elections where it's like, I'm in my own camp and wag na lang kumibo, like bahala na si Batman. So is there, I don't know, like as a, before we yield to Q&A to the both of you, I wanna ask like if there's one piece of advice that you would give to someone in terms of how to start discourse and use that to vote wisely, what would it be? Um, sa, uh, in terms of uh, sa line of work namin, I think uh, it's better to um, um, hatakin yung, conversa uh, yung conversation na hindi kayo uh, mag-aaway pero towards education, uh, mas okay yun. Ang, uh, you really don't have to convince them muna pero parang uh, the goal is para magtanong muna sila. I think that's a great uh, start for them para uh, uh, mag change ng mind nila. Uh, pero uh, in terms of uh, dahil nga in dire need of um, uh, I'm just gonna say it wag manalo sila <laughs> sila Bongbong at saka si Sarah ay uh, lagi tayo mag-share ng um, um, truths at saka uh, mga sources relevant uh, at credible sources na kaya natin uh, ilabas at saka um, if may oras tayo mag-fact check tayo ng mga bagay-bagay din doon kahit sa kahit wala mo masyado magbabasa doon sa comment section. Pero at least may 
um, maybe uh, one or two people ay magbabasa noon at uh, malalaman nila or uh, magtatanong sila about it. So, wag lang tayo mangaway kasi um, hindi lang naman tayo yung bumoboto sa mga for our own, sa sarili natin, pero kasi bumoboto tayo para sa ating lahat. Eh. Hindi, parang walang iwanan naman. Hindi, hindi iwan, uh, pati pamilya, <laughs> sorry, uh, hindi iwan yung uh, like BBM or uh, Duterte supporters kasi uh, at most sila nga yung mas, uh, um, sila yung mas kailangan ng tulong ng mga tao. Ayun, I think that, yep. uh, Yeah, the first impulse should be to listen. Uh, before you try to convince anybody, hear them out. Hear, hear where they're coming from. Because uh, like, um, the, that's, that's how discourse works. Uh, it can't, you can't just be projecting your beliefs at each other. You just have to listen. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's all. That's really it. Uh, if you're willing to listen, then maybe they'll be li willing to listen as well. Cool. So we're opening the floor to questions. Does anyone want to ask any of the panelists or myself about anything that we've talked about? No? I have a question. Um, I gave my recount of like what my personal encounter on like the state of discourse um, in the elections today. I kind of want to get your opinions on, you know, we've been in a pandemic for two years and we haven't spoken to each other like this, like in a forum. Um, and I know that when I first started interacting with people after the pandemic, it was really difficult to like look at a person in the eye and maintain a conversation. And uh, there's, there's just sort of like this juncture in that experience after two years. And now that there's the elections, there's this necessity for discourse, this necessity for discussion. Um, so I wanna know like your experiences or your opinions on like the nature of discourse right now and like just the nature of talking to one another about like important issues? I've always had social anxiety, so very little has actually changed. Uh, so yeah. You're doing uh, really well. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's a mask. Uh, it's, um, no, uh, I think people do have this uh, general anxiety uh, about talking about important things. The people won't bring it up. The, there was this whole thing where like, uh, for a while on the internet, the whole thing was like, if somebody's a DDS, don't be friends with them anymore, don't talk to them, cut them out of your lives. And that's pre-pandemic. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was actually the pandemic that, that created that kind, of, uh, that kind of separation. It's really this uh, insidious social media, Cambridge Analytica, like uh, designed to separate people, to make them, to make them, uh, to, basically create these enclaves of, uh, of belief so that certain agenda can be pushed forward without the engagement of another side. Uh, but that's online. I think uh, if you can generally in, in real social situations when faced with another person, you can over a drink, talk civilly about things and really try to understand each other. Mark, do you have to? You have anything to add to that? Yeah, I uh, yeah I agree with uh, Sir Philbert, no? Because parang um, in terms of social media, uh, pinag hindi tayo pinakikita na mga sarili-sarili nating algorithms. So parang if you talk about um, pag uh, pag mag ngayon nakikita kita na, no? Nakikita kita tal talaga tayo. Walang barriers of um, nakikita ko lang ay uh, posts for the team BBM or the team Lenny. So um, uh, pero uh, for uh, experience wise then pero nag ano pa rin kasi kami uh, zoom uh, screenings nung ano nung uh, uh, the kingmaker sa mga estudyante dun sa mga bata um, uh, medyo nakakatakot siya minsan kasi pag may mga nagpo-post na ng mga bagets na um, uh, it was better during the martial law during ganyan-ganyan tapos parang yung mga teachers ay magme-message na sa amin na may kasama tayo ibig sabihin may parents na nandun sa ano na they are uh, typing na dun sa uh, dun sa uh, 
laptop or dun sa phone ng bata, which is very sad kasi hindi sila nabibigyan ng chance to develop uh, their own way of asking questions, kung ano yung uh, information na ititake nila at hindi. So, um, yeah, uh, sana wala ng pandemic ulit. <laughs> Me too. Um, so someone on the chat box, Anon7876, has a question. Do you think Imelda should be jailed? Yes. Yes, it's yes. one yes. It's a resounding yes. I know she has a case. Um, I like something, a form of activism that I've started seeing in on Facebook is bumping old articles. Uh, about the Marcuses, um, may maybe you guys can enlighten me, but uh, Imelda was found guilty for graft, I believe. Seven counts of graft. Yeah, seven counts of graft, which she hasn't gone to jail for. Um, why is that? Like, why hasn't she gone to jail for that? Even though she's been convicted guilty. Si matanda na daw siya. Yun yung reason. Isa sa mga reasons. So parang may sakit na siya lang ganun. Oh, parang ganun. Eh, ewan ko. Yun yung alam ko. Yeah, no, that's the reason given. But really, it's because, uh, I mean, why were they allowed to come back to the Philippines? Like, why have they been around for so long? Why, uh, why are they on the covers of magazines? Why are they in being interviewed? Why are all these? Why are they still around? Why are they still around? Uh, it's like, uh, it's all part of the same thing. It's uh, it's because the structures of power in the Philippines are so. Like closely tied together, it's the same ruling family. Yeah. So it's it's Marcos is married to Ana Raneta, which connected to the. It's it's all uh, yeah. Uh, we have another uh, question from Anon one two four three. Good evening. What should we do when countered with a respect my opinion na lang during a discourse? Thank you. Or res respect opinion, respect facts. Either way. So what to do? Um, inisip ko kung paano. <laughs> uh, paano per, uh, okay. Uh, yung dun sa engagement kasi na ginagawa namin, uh, when, uh, um, when people say na respect na lang my opinion, um, maybe uh, we can bring up na parang, um, yeah, everybody's entitled to their, op their own opinions, pero kasi um, we have to accept na may mga uh, opinions na hindi nanggaling sa truths. So, um, uh, pero siyempre, sabihin natin siya in a way na hindi condescending kasi yun naman eh, parang pwede mo naman kasi actually sabihin yung mga bagay-bagay na yung factuals coming from uh, credible sources. Pero um, what's happening right now is if uh, you're anti-BBM, uh, for example, may mga tao na go to the extremes na uh, diretso, wala kang, wala kang alam na... Uh, hanggang opinion ka lang, ganyan. So, parang, uh, huwag, natin, huwag natin siya gawing practice. <laughs> Kasi mas lalo natin silang na, uh, natutulak pa paalis dun sa gusto, uh, sa gusto natin malaman nila kaysa dun sa... Um, Kasi parang kapag sinabi na um, wala kang alam, kakausapin mo pa ba yung tao na yun? Parang hindi na. <laughs> so, yeah. Phil, how about you? What to do when someone asks... Just respect my opinion or respect the facts. Uh, I mean, uh, iba yon. Respect my opinion, respect the facts. Because hindi naman facts yung usually sinasabi nila. Pero uh, I mean, it's hard to force somebody who doesn't want to talk to talk or to listen to you. But like the approach I've had in um, the approach I've had in this isn't in uh, in politics, but in film, because that also comes up. Respect my opinion. This is uh, I I like this film. I don't like this film. I don't care. But like uh, <laughs> the idea is to make sure that um, make sure that they know that it is coming from a personal place. Uh, like uh, when you when I talk about film, I always try to center it on my own experience. So when they talk about respecting, when they say respect my opinion, it's almost when I project, when I tell them what my experience is, uh, the idea is to, parang, without having to say it, well, you have to respect mine then. Uh, if we have differing opinions, it's because we are rooted in different experiences. And the least I can do is share my experience. Are there any questions on the floor here? Oh, um, you at the back. 
Um, you want the microphone? Here, hold on. Um, it's like it's weird because I'm near you guys already. So <laughs> uh, these types of discourses, um, I feel, honestly, still an eco cha chamber for, I guess, us. Um, I guess my question is, how do you reach more so the E and D populace, um, who makes up the bulk of the voting population? Um, I, if if we compare, say. Um, I mean, uh, Marcus's like campaign video. You've seen it the, with the puppet. In comparison to what Lenny pushes out, um, that type of stuff works for the massa. It kind of looks similar to, I guess, popular uh, sh shows. Um, you know, unlike say the movies that we see in film festivals, it's not as popular. So I guess my question is, how do we prevent or change the narrative of seeing this as a high and mighty kind of thing that it's only for the more intelligent people rather than you know, reaching the people who may not understand even what this course means. Um, uh, there are actually um, versions na of uh, The Kingmaker, parang kakalabas lang niya na merong um, uh, in different language, uh, languages, uh, subtitled, tsaka may uh, Tagalog dub version na rin siya. So parang mas madali siyang, and then all, free din siya, na pwede siyang panoorin dun sa mga, uh, papanoorin sa mga tao. So parang, um, yung actually experience ko na uh, may favorite tindera kami sa ano, sa, <laughs> dun sa, kung saan kami nakatira, si Ate Gemma, um, gusto niyang uh, magpakita ng mga things na hindi pa nakikita ng mga um, uh, tawag dito, mga na, bumibili sa kanya, ganyan. So parang nanghingi siya ng kopya, ay sabi ko, bibigyan ko siya ng kopya ng uh, The Kingmaker. Tapos um, pwede niyang ipapanood na lang dun sa mga tao. So parang uh, pwede kasi siyang, um, pwede personal mo na lang siyang gawin na magpalabas uh, or magpakita or magpa magpapanood. Pero um, we help also with um, yung mga gusto na may discuss discussion afterwards no sa, sa aktivista. So uh, ang usually kumakontakt sa amin ay mga teachers, um, um, mga school uh, school uh, organizations na um, sila mismo yung uh, nagbibigay at ah, tag dito nag nanghihingi ng tulong to provide platforms para um, umikot naman tong uh, pelikula at para mapag-usapan din ng mga uh, ng mga tao na um, tag dito na pansin ko na hindi na lang siya echo chamber na nung um, there was this one time sa Saint uh, Saint Scholastica Pampanga na ayun na nga hindi na nga naiintindihan ng mga bata kung saan sila kukuha ng credible sources nila sino nang paniniwalaan nila and at the same time may mga <laughs> may mga parents from the background na na, na, na pinapakailaman yung mga anak nila during uh, the discussion so parang um tiyagalan guys kaya natin to <laughs> yeah. elections are one on the ground talagang so like the most important thing the Lenny campaign is doing for example is going house to house the house to house campaigns uh, bringing it helps that they bring celebrities along <laughs> they bring like angel Luxin has been to so many houses galing niya um but yeah it's a uh, yeah you want you want to have this discourse volunteer volunteer to go house to house for the Lenny campaign yeah um anyone else on the floor um uh i'll take the both of you so but i i want you to go first um yes you you said that you have a question no yes you yeah Uh, hello. So I just want to go back to the film. So since you kept on mentioning that uh, Greenfield's recurring theme is uh, parang she's so into showing uh, the grandeur, the elegance, uh, the richness as what we can see in, in her films. Uh, I want to ask, uh, would there be any difference if a Filipino director or a writer made this film? Because especially now that uh, red tagging is very rampant in our country, so uh, a lot of filmmakers would be, uh, or if not, if they're not scared, 
uh, some somehow in the production, someone would be censoring those parts and it would be cut off in the final cut. So would there be any difference if a Filipino filmmaker would do this? Again, I'll point to Aswang. Uh, Aswang isn't the only film about the drug war. There's also a film called uh, On the Orders of the President. Uh, 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 on the... Uh, on the... Uh, on the presidents, on the president's orders, which were made by foreigners. And uh, you can see the difference in approach because the, that film uh, is centered on the police. And they, and they capture... They, uh, they, they follow a police... Uh, a, a, a particular precinct around... And so we hear the side of the police for the whole time. Uh, Aswang, Alex Arumpak, doesn't talk to the police, doesn't talk to politicians, doesn't bother to get the side of, I don't know, because, because, I, because I, again, because I think she knows that like uh, what the story is and what, like, what the police will say. So like, yeah, I think a Filipino filmmaker Hopefully, making up well, again. This this is weird to say because Ramona Diaz made Imelda and she talked to Imelda for 90 minutes without really any counterpoint. Parang mas may counterpoint pa yung the kingmaker. Uh, but like, uh, I think a Filipino maker trying to tell this particular story about the Marcoses trying to come back specifically in the context of the vice presidential uh, 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 election, maybe would have not talk to the Marcoses? Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. Again, it's hard to speculate. But on that specific example, I can tell you, uh, 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 foreigners talk to the police. A local filmmaker only talk to people on the street. Um, there was one more hand. Oh. Yes. Go. Yeah, please do. The microphone's not long enough. No, I... Um, you mentioned earlier about the mothering aspect or the narrative of Imelda, of how she um, has mastered the way of this image of being a mother, you know? Th that's why she's, she's um, come to be loved by the people. But then right now, if you see Lenny, she also has somewhat that image, like the mother, she's a doting mom. But then how is Bong Bong still leading? Could it also be like a fathering thing? Are we also gravitating towards like a father figure? Just like how Duterte, like people see him as like tatay and could it also be that way? When I think of Bong Bong, I don't think of a father. Eh? Yeah. Like, the, the son, the, the inutile son yeah. who, is, who can only follow in like who can who only has status because of who his father is so like i don't know if it's a father thing i think it, it it's it's the continued popularity of the marcoses is a uh, coordinated like misinformation campaign uh, that stems from the fact that like when we had a chance to get rid of the marcoses we didn't this is the greatest failure of the philippines Uh, Mark, yeah, you have something. So, sorry. Uh, well, pa, yeah, ganun din. Parang they can't even use the strongman narrative kay Bong Bong eh. Kasi hindi talaga bagay sa kanya. Pero uh, when you look at uh, posters, there's always his father beside him. Na, um, ang tawag dito, na I think nagamit din naman ng mga Aquinos yun before kay Noy Noy. No? Na may, nandun yung tatay at nanay niya. The mother and father of democracy. So parang, um, uh, yeah, uh, orchestrated siya na bagay, kaya siya, um, kaya mas uh, ganun pa rin yung per perception ng mga tao kay, kay Bongbong. So parang hindi, na, parang hindi siya nalalayo sa tatay niya or something. Mas parang ganun siya. Cool guys, that's all the time we have. Thank you to everyone here in Auto for braving the weather and coming over. And to everyone online on MCR tuning in, and thank you to Mark and Philbert for lending their insight. So Cultural Learnings is an editorial platform for discussions on culture that I run. It's a newsletter and a radio show on Manila Community Radio. I'm on MCR every month, and this is, I guess, my show for the month, and I'm back 
next month with something else. I'm not sh quite sure yet what, but stay tuned in for that. And for those here in Otto, please stick around for a drink or a coffee or just to have a chat about the film. And yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in. This is Sai Versai signing off and you've been listening to Cultural Learnings on Manila Community Radio.